pretty much everyone, regardless of political party, would like to see more women in office. Um, and so we spend a lot of time thinking about the reasons why women don't run for office. But since we have four current candidates up here, I thought we would kick off by talking about the reasons why they do run. Uh, so Christina, I want to start with you because you first ran for office for the State House when you were 19, which is an age when a lot of us are not even really thinking about politics, much less launching our own campaigns. So what inspired that? So as a young woman, I had three amazing older brothers, um, and I think we need more of that in a time like this, but they really challenged me and encouraged me, and I watched my mother thrive in male-dominated environments. Um, she worked alongside my father in our heating and plumbing business, and I watched my family engage in public service across all fronts, whether it was as township trustees or firefighters or EMTs. I knew that there was a place for each and every one of us in our family to make a difference. And I knew by the time I was 11 or 12 years old that I wanted to use my voice to make a difference in my community. And so we ran at 19 and unfortunately were pretty staunchly opposed by the party. The establishment spent 70,000 against us in a non-incumbent open seat primary. And that just fueled my fire all the more. So three years later, I became the legislator in that seat. And we've been serving for almost seven years against this will of having young women empowered in public office. It's an interesting note about you know, your, your father and the power of having role models and having a family that participates in politics. Uh, Krish, I want to ask you, We've all read a lot about, particularly after the 2016 election, that there is you know, what's being described as a wave of Democratic women coming forward, uh, particularly in opposition to President Trump. So do you consider yourself and your candidacy to be part of that wave? Yeah, I mean, I think that part of uh, what made me decide to run, and I'm sure many of you may have experienced this emotional roller coaster over the last year, um, going from electing the first black president to someone who uh, threatens to reverse that um, progress and everything uh, beyond that um, certainly colored uh, my decision. I remember the president the day after the election uh, calling some of our staff into the Rose Garden and saying, we lick our wounds off, we, uh, you know, we um, uh, brush off our shoulders and we get back in the arena. And for me, it had always been working on the policy side, but I realized that more than ever, uh, when it comes to politics, people have to get off the sideline. Um, at the same time, while I was at the White House, I was pregnant. And so I actually made the decision to run while I was pregnant. Perhaps it was because I was so hormonal that I made this you know, <laughs> crazy decision um, to run. There was actually a wonderful mentor of mine, uh, Ambassador Swanee Hunt. She said, why don't you just announce from the delivery room, she's out, I'm in. <laughs> and I thought, that is fabulous. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, I mean, the truth is, you know, every time Trump and his cabinet of billionaires, um, you know, attack public health or public education, um, every time they try to deprive um, women, minorities, immigrants of their basic rights, every time they question, you know, the legitimacy, as we're seeing kind of on this television screen today, um, the legitimacy of our intelligence agencies, the judiciary, the free press, we realize the consequences of elections, of, what's, of what matters, of what's at stake. And so that's why I decided to run. Uh, and Tally, you were also involved, involved in the 2016 election. Mm -hmm. You were running your state, West Virginia, for Hillary Clinton's campaign. Uh, she ended up losing the state and I think about 25% of the vote mm -hmm. there. So what do, what do you see that's changed in the past 12 months that suggests to you that the people that did not come out to support her will come out to support you? So I was uh, on the front lines in 2016, and I saw the frustration and the anger. It was in my face every single day. I think the difference in the last 12 months has been that I've actually listened to the people of West Virginia, and we've got these uh, politicians uh, and good old boys in D.C. that just fall in lockstep with their political party, and they've forgotten who they're there for, and that's the people of West Virginia. And so. I think that at the end of the day, people care more, and we saw this in Virginia and across the country last week. They care more about their health care. They care more about their job and their community and ending the opioid epidemic. And for people to get hung up on uh, something that never happened, like I expect them to uh, in West Virginia from the other side, I say bring it. I mean, we're going to go out there and we're going to fight to win because it's just too important. 
And my state needs a champion right now, and I'm gonna work like you know what to be that champion. You have a personal connection to the opioid crisis also, is that? I do. Has that been a motivating factor for you? I do, I mean, everyone is touched in a different way in West Virginia, and for me, it's very personal, so I get all riled up when I hear these politicians talking, you know, oh, I'm for you, and then they go up to D.C. and they cut Medicaid funding, which supports um, efforts to combat the drug epidemic. I mean, my sister is an addict, and she's got three kids that are 19, 17, and 11. And my mom is raising them. By the way, my mom's 65. She's still a high school teacher. She's working. She's raised six kids of her own. <laughs> like, but this is the new West Virginia family, an American family. And she's scraping to get by. And these kids are at risk right now. And it is going to determine the future of our state. And it's going to determine the future of our country. Mm. So it's, it's very personal to me. And to me, that is a fight worth fighting. Yeah. Um, and Erica, you've won, run for office before. Once before, yes. Mm -hmm. And that was a, you ran for Congress and you lost in the primaries. Yes. Uh, what, is there a particular lesson that you take from that experience that you think you're going to be able to apply to this race that's gonna make the difference? One of the things that I learned is how important it is, especially if you're a woman running for office, to say why you're the most qualified person for the job. Mm -hmm. I think probably everyone in here can relate to feeling like you're the most qualified, but sort of feeling like it would be arrogant or narcissistic to say that. But right now in the challenging political climate, people are looking for leadership. And if you feel that you're the right person, you need to say it because people are looking for people to fight for them. And so I think during the congressional campaign, I set forth my qualifications, but didn't necessarily make the case why I was the right person to be their representative. And now as running for attorney general, it's very important to me to be able to set forth a vision the corruption, some of the criminal justice reform measures that I want to set forth, but also to tell them why I think I'm uniquely qualified to be Illinois' next attorney general. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a powerful lesson for women in all fields, um, the importance of not just being the best person, but reminding everyone that you're the best person. And I think it's also important for women to be willing to champion each other. If you see another woman who is successful, be her advocate and be her champion because sometimes it is difficult for women to promote themselves. And so I think regardless of political affiliation, if you see a woman that's successful and is passionate, that makes you proud to be a woman, be a champion for her. And I think we all benefit that way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think another thing, Lee touched on this in the introduction uh, that we're struggling with in this country right now is that we feel extremely divided. Certainly it feels more divided than it ever has before in my lifetime. And I think one open question is whether electing more women to office has a potential to change that. Um, so Christina, in your experience as a legislator, have you felt like women, or have you seen examples of women being more likely to reach across the aisle? Absolutely, so I do, I do wanna say as well, I think I'm probably an extreme minority in this room as I am in most circumstances. Being socially and fiscally conservative can be very lonely as a woman. Um, but that's just because that voice has not been shared on a lot of fronts and we don't get the same opportunities to spread and share that voice. And part of that is the process that holds us back from getting through the primaries. Um, but I do believe that women on either side of the aisle work extremely hard and incredibly hard to work with both sides of the aisle to ensure that we get solutions to our problems. I mean, for example, today in Columbus, um, a bill that is bipartisan in nature with my name and a prominent Democrat's name is being championed in the state legislature to protect children and to ensure that we have sexual abuse prevention legislation in our schools. And we've been working that through the process for the last several general assemblies, and it's taken a team effort across the aisles to really educate on all fronts how necessary it is. But yes, absolutely, women are solution seekers. We don't care what your political affiliation is. We don't care what church you go to. We don't care if you grew up with boys or girls. We care that you are a person and we are meant to serve you and to find a solution for you. What do you think about that, Krish? I mean, you were in Washington working for Hillary Clinton, working for Michelle Obama for many years. Did, did you also see, do you see examples of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do think part of the rhetoric that we're hearing obviously affects the policies. And so um, it's certainly factored into my decision in the sense that in Maryland, we have a Republican governor in a two to one Democratic state. 
And unfortunately, we have a governor who refuses to stand up and speak uh, out against a president who, frankly, I think denounces and denigrates uh, a lot of us in this room um, and a lot of what I'm proud to be. I'm a woman, I'm a minority, I'm an immigrant, and a mom. Um, the best article that was written after I announced was Donald Trump's worst nightmare runs for governor of Maryland. Um, it has been sort of my badge of honor. But the, the sad reality... <laughs> Um, is that it isn't just about the rhetoric, right? I mean, I know some of you have already heard some of the statistics, but I'll uh, tailor it to Maryland. Um, out of uh, 14 federal and statewide offices, so eight congressmen, two senators, a lieutenant governor, attorney general, comptroller, um, and uh, treasurer, no, no, lieutenant governor, governor, <laughs> attorney general, and comptroller, all of those positions are filled by men which means that we have the same representation as we did 100 years ago before we had the right to vote or 200 years ago before we could own property. But that's a broader issue, right? If you take Virginia, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland, out of 66 positions, there are two. And those two are both Republican women. Um, and this is where Maryland's never had a female governor. The Democratic Party has never had a woman of color, whereas the Republicans have had two in Susanna Martinez and Nikki Haley, and it affects our policies, right? Um, one of the things that I championed as my first policy was guaranteeing that Maryland was the first state uh, that has three months of paid family leave. Um, the US is the only developed democracy in the world that doesn't guarantee parents Paid, paid family leave. And you know whether it's that or yesterday I announced the first um, policy on sexual harassment. Um, there is no state in the nation that has an office of sexual harassment um, and sexual violence. Um, these are the issues where our uh, lack of a voice ma matters. Um, Maryland is the only, one of few states that allows for rapists to have paternity rights still. Um, this is what we need to address. Uh, I have um, another question, but I'd like you guys to start thinking about your questions for the panel. I'll come to you in just a second. Um, Another thing that we saw in the presidential election is that uh, some of the nasty rhetoric was not just political. Uh, we also saw, uh, with the first woman running for president for a major party, we saw a lot of sexist rhetoric out there. Um, and I'm curious about how you think about that going into your own campaigns. Um, and I know, you know, Tally, you must have seen that uh, very up close and personal working for Clinton's campaign. So, is it, did it give you pause when you thought about running? No. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, for me, first of all, there's a woman who's already held this seat, a Republican woman who's now our U.S. Senator in West Virginia. Uh, so it's been done before. But I don't want people to vote for me because I'm a woman. I want them to vote for me because I'm going to get stuff done for them and deliver for them. And I'm the only West Virginian in the race only native West Virginian. And these people are my people. I am them, they are me. And so for me to worry about what I look like or what my gender is or, you know, anything, I mean, more people are worried about what side of the tracks you grew up on, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And so it's going to be my job over the course of the next year is to make those connections with folks West Virginian to West Virginian, and I think that that's what my focus will be. Yeah. And Erica, in your campaigns, I know you have already experienced uh, both sexist and racist comments. Can you tell us about that and how you dealt with it? Well, at the beginning of my campaign, there was a county chairman who sent out a, I think what anyone would, would characterize as a very sexist and racist email. Mm -hmm. And it was caused sort of a dilemma because obviously I wanted to denounce it and condemn it in strong language. But what you risk happening is having your race derailed by something that wasn't of your choosing. And so a big part of being successful politically is being able to control the narrative of your race and stay focused on the issues that people really care about. So the way I handled it was to put out a statement that denounced it, but to make clear why I was still in the race. And one of the things that I feel very strongly about is how important it is for women to call out bad behavior when they see it on the other side of the aisle. Because sometimes when you are, ha as a candidate, are denouncing bad behavior that's directed towards you, you're, so you're sort of accused of politicizing something or not being tough enough. And I think that's where women need to be allies. If you see someone on the other side being attacked in a gendered way, I think as a woman, you owe it to them to stand up and to denounce it. And it doesn't mean that we have to agree on every policy position, but the political climate becomes easier for all women to participate if we're willing to be allies in calling out bad behavior. That's really interesting. Let's see uh, questions for our panelists. I see one right here in the front row. 
Oh, and one over here. Yes. Okay. OK, we'll get to both of you. All right. So um, I want to ask the uh, Republican candidates if they support President Trump. And the reason that I want to ask you that is um, I am a, a experienced political donor. I raise a lot of money for candidates. I would like to support the uh, women candidates. But I feel like Donald Trump has raised a bunch of issues. He's dangerously unqualified for the job. And Republicans have said it. So Jeff Flake has said it. Bob Corker has said it. I'm going to invite you now to tell us whether you support Donald Trump and his uh, dangerous anti-woman agenda. Um, he is admitted to committing sexual assault. So I think your choice to run as Republicans is interesting. In a different time with a different leader at the head of your party, it might be a different situation. But this is this time, this is now, and we have a sexual assailant in the White House who's running your party. So why are you a member of that party? I'm a member of the Republican Party because of the principles of limited government. I consider myself to be a fiscal conservative, and I believe a lot of the policy positions that have been set forth in terms of helping people and having actual tangible improvements, I think that the Republican solutions, from my perspective, would be best. As Attorney General, my job is neither to support nor oppose whoever is the president because my job is to enforce the rule of law, and I take that very seriously. So I'm not running for attorney general as a platform to denounce whoever may be in office, whether it's a person of my party or not. It's to stay focused on what my state's interests are, to stay focused on what it is that the law says, and to make sure that I champion the interests of my state. I think that it's very tempting, regardless of whether you support or oppose the person who's the chief executive to use the platform in that way, to champion them or oppose them. But I take very seriously the job of attorney general. It's to be an advocate for all of the people's interests. So if the policy exceeds the scope of his executive power, then I wouldn't hesitate to challenge him. But if it is within the scope of his power, then that is something that he would have the right to do. But I take very seriously the job description that I'm running for, and I'm very proud to do that. I just told you, as Attorney General, it's my job to stay focused on what are the interests of the people of my state. It's not my job to support or oppose any person who's in power. Christina? So the, the fun thing about running for public office is you have to hold on to your convictions. And at the end of the day, you have to be able to sleep. And there are a lot of people that will offer or extend donations if you are to fit in a certain category or a certain silo. Um, and unfortunately, you run into that every single day on the campaign trail, and there are people that have asked me to bail out major companies in my policy position, and in good conscience, I wouldn't do that. I would do the decision making based on the situation at hand. And what I can tell you is I'm about to become incredibly unpopular in this room. And the reason being is I truly believe that Donald Trump is the president that is needed for this time. And hear me out. I met this person on the campaign trail. And when I met him, he treated me with more respect than the GOP establishment has ever treated me with. And his children were respectful. They were hardworking. They were intelligent. They were articulate. They spoke to policy. We sat for two and a half, almost three hours. I talked to Eric and Laura Trump about policies as far spread as foster and adoption care to the financial crisis that we are in as a nation, um, anything from the tax code to you name it, energy utility policy, which are incredibly important to both Republicans and Democrats. Our fiscal house is in extreme disarray. And whatever your policy positions are, nobody can argue that $20 trillion in debt, $60 trillion in owed services, $60 trillion in debt on those owed services is a detriment to this nation. So. I am proudly in support of the President of the United States, and I was a supporter of Cruz before I was a supporter of Trump, so is the man flawed? Absolutely. But I think every person in this room is flawed, and I am flawed as well. I mean, I think that we all need to be met with grace in our pursuit to serve. And if you look at somebody who's willing to forego their extreme financial opportunity to try to better the country, that's commendable and respectable, in my opinion. And I know I just lost a lot of friends in this room. But I have to speak my truth and say what I believe. I met the person. That was my experience. Um, being on the campaign trail, even for Donald Trump, was lonely. But I did it because I believed it was the right direction for our nation based off of his policies and his direction. 
And in that experience, I was named as the youngest female to chair the electoral college in the history of the state. So I don't think that he is anti-woman by any means. That's not been my experience on a direct basis, but that has absolutely been the rhetoric that is spread far and wide every day in the media. Okay, I wanna to get to our last question. So uh, my question is what systemic barriers are, um, prevent women from getting involved in politics? So you touched on primary. I was wondering, is it fundraising? What are those barriers and what are you doing to overcome them or what can we do to overcome them? I'll, go ahead, take Never. it, Krish. Or Money. <laughs> yeah. Tallysargent.com. You can help. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's either we all say, oh, we want more women in office regardless of political party, mm -hmm. and then we need women to step up and show us, walk the walk and talk the talk. And so I think that that is a huge barrier. Um, I also think that our approach to things, again, just collectively, is you mentioned earlier that we need to tell people that we're qualified and share that with folks. Guys walk in the room like they are the next president of the United right. States. So, I mean, we're not only stepping out and putting ourselves out there on the line, but uh, I think that the key, some of the key pillars and one of the things I'm seeing is you have to raise money and it takes a lot of your time mm -hmm. um, and effort to do that and takes time away from your future constituents. Um, and so I think that that's a, a really key factor for a lot of people who can't bankroll themselves. Yeah. Chris, you were gonna say something. I'm gonna give you the last yeah, word. Yeah, so I, I would just add to that because <clears throat> um, uh, fundraising is, I think, the biggest barrier. Um, part of it is that you have more male self-financed candidates. Part of it is that the male establishment does control a lot of the kind of key party structure. Um, part of it is that uh, women don't donate at um, as high rates. Only 20% of political dollars come from women. Right. Um, so feel free to go to www.krishformaryland.com. <laughs> but I will also say, quite candidly, it is personal in some ways too. Um, you know, I will say that you know, I still get the question of, well, as a new mom, you know, isn't it tough to run? Like, how are you not abandoning your daughter? And my husband is the CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. He crisscrosses the state on a weekly basis. But no one ever asked him the question of, how do you as a new dad balance your responsibilities? And we know all this, right? We know that it's not a matter of a balance in the sense that you are doing one or the other. We are oftentimes nursing as we're editing presentations or speeches, or you're doing a conference call as you're giving your daughter a bath, um, as we do. But time and time again, I still get questions like that, or I get questions of, you know, why didn't you change your last name instead of Vignaraja to Omera? It sure would be a lot easier. And my answer was, well, I got married when I was late, and I've always known myself, and I will always know myself as Krishanthi Vignaraja. And so this is where, you know, it is a balance between uh, being true to yourself and also knowing that, you know, there are sometimes I have anxiety of, um, you know, um, uh, this uh, FOMO, a feeling of missing out, right? As I'm here in California this week, I said to my daughter, who's four and a half months, I said, please don't sit up while I'm gone. <laughs> um, and, you know, that on a personal level is the struggle that we do face. Well, it's great to have two moms on the panel. We need more moms in office. And women donate to women. Okay, we have to leave it there, ladies. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you.